And good beer. All right, now if you have your Bibles, would you turn to the book of uh, Hebrews, chapter 7, with me tonight, please? Hebrews. Hebrews. The ancient Eber. Abraham's called a Hebrew, Abram, Eber. Uh, Hebrews chapter number 7 and verse number 1. Scripture says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation, king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch, Abraham, gave the tenth of the spoils. Father, bless the word of God now. In Jesus' name, amen. The writer of Hebrews is constantly comparing people and places with the Lord Jesus Christ and showing in every instance, makes no difference where it is, who it is, Christ is by far greater. And Melchizedek here in verse number three, he's made like unto the Son of God. Who is he? Uh, you can get into one of the most uh, controversial figures in the Bible to tell you the truth. Good men, good people differ about who Melchizedek is. This is not one of those things you want to get in a dog fight over. Just leave it where it is. Some say it's Shem. Some say it's a pre-incarnate Christ. Some say uh, other this and that and so forth and so on. I don't know who it is, but I know one thing. I believe the Bible and I believe he's here. <laughs> I believe this is somebody that lived in, uh, in uh, time is about 1,900 years before Christ. The chronology of the Old Testament and the New Testament helpful a great deal in understanding the Bible. David's timeline is about 1,000 B.C. We'll be getting into that in a few minutes. You're looking at a span of almost 1,000 years in the Scripture. And so Melchizedek is the king of Salem. So where is Salem? Where is Salem? Well, Salem is the old ancient Jerusalem or Jerusalem, as we say here in English. It's Jerusalem, the city of peace, Jerusalem. And if you notice, it says that he's the king of Salem, priest of the Most High God. When David took the city, first the land was taken by Joshua, and then they finally got to Jerusalem. And when they got there, the Jebusite uh, was in the land. He was there. And uh, the Jebusite was not about to give up anything he had. He had to be taken, driven out. The Jebusite is a Canaanite. And you remember reading in your Bible when Noah said, Cursed be Canaan. And what you'll find in the Bible more than one time is where someone is trying to usurp from someone greater, a blessing, a gift, or something of that nature. For example, King Herod, when the Lord Jesus Christ was here 2,000 years ago, Herod was an Edomian. What is that? That is a descendant of Edom. If you remember, Edom is another word for Esau. And if you remember, Esau did something that was despicable in the sight of the Lord. What was that? He sold his birthright for a bowl of pottage. All right, and so he does this, but then later on his descendants want the spiritual authority back. And this is what happens, and this is what you have. It's a remarkable thing to think about this, though. 1,900 years before Christ, this man was the king of Salem. In other words, the stronghold of the Canaanite or the Jebusite, one and the same. And it's obvious that through those 900 years until you come to David, that they never one time accepted, apparently, for no indication in the Bible, accepted the faith of Melchizedek. When Abraham came out of Ur of the Chaldees, he came, from a, he came from a pagan structure, a pagan culture. The Chaldean was part of the priest class of the Babylonians. The Chaldeans were the ones that you go back and study, you'll find out they're the ones who were uh, essentially, uh, they read the sky, they read the stars and everything else that had to do with their priesthood. And so Abram was called out of that. Abraham followed the light that he had. This is one of the greatest truths about Abraham you're going to find in the Bible. And so there's no, there's no indication in the scripture that Abraham had any contact whatsoever with Melchizedek until he came out of the land. And then once he came out of the land and met him, and we have no indication here whether he had met him before 
and knew him personally or what. But when he did, he immediately acknowledged his superiority and he paid him a tithe. And the New Testament says, truly the less is blessed of the greater. And Melchizedek blessed Abraham. Abraham didn't bless Melchizedek. Melchizedek blessed him. And of course, what he's doing is recognizing the priesthood, the spiritual authority of Melchizedek over him. Amen, 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 amen. Now, I want to talk about Jerusalem tonight for a minute. It's a very important place. All the way back to the time of Abram when he brought his son, Esau, uh, uh, Isaac, he brought him to Mount Moriah to offer him as a sacrifice unto God. This place, Moriah, means where God sees and where God will be seen. In other words, he sees and he will be seen. In other words, he knows you and you'll know him. You'll meet him at Moriah. The Lord Jesus Christ was crucified at Moriah. There's a strong Jewish tradition among the rabbis that Adam was created from Moriah. Therefore, Moriah stands in the very center of everything in the Old Testament that has to do with an approach unto God. Moriah was right smack in the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden went all the way from the river, the Hittakel, which is the, is the Euphrates today. And he and went all the way from that, all the way to the Great Sea or the, sea, the Mediterranean Sea. So the, the measurement of Eden was much larger than the land mass that Israel owns today. But this is what God gave them. And they have yet to occupy what's theirs. Uh, the next time you hear the news media mention the West Bank, they're talking about Judea and Samaria, okay? They're talking about the land of the Jews uh, when they use the term West Bank. And of course, you understand, don't you, that buzzwords, if you want to go to the top and you want to be part of the scene, you want to be part of what's happening, you'll learn what all the buzzwords are. You'll learn what all of the, uh, the identity movement's about, and you'll join in ranks and you'll sing their song and march to their tune. Amen. Anything that, are you following me? You'll do it. Yeah. If you don't do it, you don't get anywhere. Yeah. Well, what about freedom of speech? It does not exist. I warned you for years that it was going to be taken away. It's gone. And what we do now, we're coming to the point where maybe by the grace of God, we can win some of it back. Uh, right now in Canada, they're taking preachers if they say the wrong thing and they're putting them in jail. So they've gone a little further than we have in this country. But it's coming if something doesn't happen. So Abraham's quite a figure. Mount Moriah is important. Mount Moriah had what's called the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. Remember the Canaanite. Or he's also called Ornan the Jebusite. This threshing floor is a very important place in the Bible. The threshing floor is a place where the floor itself, the threshing floor itself, is hard and flat as they can get it. And then they take the sheaves and they lay them down. And then they take an animal or something of that nature and they trod it out, which breaks up the sheaves and it breaks it up from the chaff. And then they take what's called a winnowing fork and they'll pick it up while the wind is blowing. They'll toss it into the air and the chaff is light. It has no substance. Have you ever met people with no substance? <laughs> if you ever have, you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, talking heads, big mouths, and that's all this is, as far as it goes. That's no substance. Words are cheap. But anyway, they'll toss it up into the air and the wind will catch the chaff and blow it away. And the grain will fall down to the ground. This is what Ruth did when she went to the threshing floor of Boaz. Boaz was important because Boaz is a type of Christ. The threshing floor in Jerusalem was a place where you know Christ was crucified. So therefore, it is a place of the separation of the believer from the unbeliever. That's what typology is of this threshing floor. The wind, which is a picture of the Holy Spirit of God, blows the chaff away and all is left is the grain. The same thing today, folks. He, the, Lord, uh, the apostle over there in the, in the book of Acts said, you do always as your fathers did, you resist the Holy Ghost. You resist him. Stephen's the one that said that. Uh, he was a deacon. He said, you resist the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit of God is absolutely essential to the new birth, to worship, to understanding, inspiration, anything that has to do with it, the Holy Spirit. What man tries to do is to create, is to try to replace the power and presence of the Holy Spirit by emotionalism. Yeah. Let that sink in for a moment. Let it sink in. I remember a man telling me one time, he said, I visited this church 
And he said, when I walked through the door, he said, it's just dead as it could be. But the minute the music, the minute the music started, they were jumping up and down and screaming and yelling and having a time like you wouldn't believe. I mean, this was the most spirit filled place I've ever been to till the music stopped. And then when the music stopped, they all walked out the back door and it's back to business as usual. That's emotionalism. That has nothing to do with the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. The Holy Spirit of God will blow the chaff away. The scripture says in the book of Psalm that uh, the wicked cannot stand in the congregation of the righteous. Amen. It's very uncomfortable when the real spirit shows up. Oh yeah, no problem. No problem with worship leaders and all the contemporary music that gets you stirred up, moved, and all of that. No problem. But you let the Holy Spirit of God begin to move in a place, and you'll find people searching their soul and worshiping God. You'll find sinners rejoicing for being forgiven. And that's exactly what it's all about in the Bible. Amen. But here in the book of, uh, here, back in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Salem, uh, which means peace, uh, the Arabic for it is shalom. The Hebrew is shalom. And, he, and the Arabic is salim. They both mean peace. Uh, we have Melchizedek and we have much typology. But the thing about the threshing floor is that it's a type of where the sinner is separated from the unbeliever. When we come to the threshing floor of Ruth in the book of Ruth, it's quite a beautiful picture. Because Boaz said to Ruth, he said, Blessed be thou, Ruth, for you have chosen to Come under the shadow of the wings of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Isn't that beautiful? That really is. That's, you come to his wings, to gather yourself under his wings. You remember what the Lord Jesus said to Jerusalem? O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that stonest the prophets and killest them which are sent unto thee, how oft I would have gathered thee together as a hen gathereth the chickens. You remember that? That's what he's talking about. Under the shadow of the Almighty, to be safe under his wing. Ruth chose that. So what happens? Well, Boaz in his threshing floor, it's not so much a matter of separating the sinner from the saint. It's a matter of separating the church from everything else because she becomes a type of the bride of Christ. Why? Because Boaz is a type of Christ and she comes underneath his skirt and there at that threshing floor, a separation takes place. Ruth is never the same again because he's accepted into a family that she chose to follow a road that led her to where she is. Now, when you walk out of here tonight, you're going to go on a road. You're going to follow a road. You're going to go about a way of life. You're going to continue with it. Uh, unless something happens in this house tonight that really gets a hold of your soul and changes your life and moves you into another direction. You remember I told you before, the Bible says, it's not in the way of man. It's not in, in man to know his way to know how to choose his way. It isn't. We don't have that ability. We have to let God direct us by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we have to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. We have to know the Spirit of God. And uh, that's so important. It really is. So Jerusalem and Abraham and the, uh, and the, and the, and the meeting together here in the book of Hebrews chapter number seven, where it's talking about it, and back in the book of Genesis, Abraham had just left the Sodom and the kings of the dale, the slaughter of all that, he had just left them. And he met Melchizedek and he gave him tithes of all that he had. And they had oil and wine. They had, they had a, a bread and wine rather. They had a meal. They had a, they had a service between the two of them because they, were, they, were, they believed in the same God. Let's put it that way. They believed in the same God. The Old Testament, like for example, Moses, what was his father-in-law's name? Anybody remember? Jethro. And he was the priest of Midian, right? He was the priest of Midian, Jethro. And what you find in the Old Testament are pockets here and there of people who believe, who trust God, who have an understanding and revelation of who God is. Remember this, folks. 1,900 years before Christ, a Bible did not exist on this earth. No books of the Bible had been written except possibly the book of Job. There were no books of the Bible. So what did they follow? They followed what had been taught them, what had been handed down to them, what they understood the truth to be. And it's the same today. If you want the truth, you're going to get the truth. You've got the truth in your hands. You've got it right there in your lap. And the Holy Spirit of God wrote that book. And if you'll open your heart, he'll teach you that book. 
Did you know that I day in and day out get on my face before God and I say, Lord, teach me thy word. Teach me. Because deep, deep down inside my soul, I seriously tonight feel like that I'm just beginning to learn. It took those, all those years to get to the point to where I would learn what God wants me to know. I'm not talking about a cursory skim the surface uh, business where, you know, where, where you, you just quote a scripture, but you have no idea what you're quoting. I'm talking about God, show me what's this mean? What's the truth of it? And we'll get into it in just a moment because it's very important. So the threshing floor is a, is a very important thing. The Bible prophesies here in Matthew chapter number three and verse number 12. Here we have John the Baptist preaching and here's what he said. He said, whose fan is in his hand and he will freely purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now, since I gave you that preview of the threshing floor, see if you can put that together. The fan is the winnowing fan. It's the fork, all right? It's in his hand. He will freely purge his floor. He's going to take that winnowing fork and he's going to toss it up into the air and it's going to blow the chaff away. And then he'll gather his wheat into the garner. That's us. And then he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So John the Baptist is prophesying of how the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come to a threshing floor. And there he's going to choose and separate his own. And that's what he's doing. That's what he's been doing. You're here tonight because he called you. You didn't find him, he found you. Amen. Aren't you glad for that? Yeah. Amen. Think about all those that he's come to and they wouldn't listen to him. And they turned him away. The Bible said in Psalm 1, 4, the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Hosea 13, 3, therefore they shall be as the morning cloud and as the early dew that passeth away, as the chaff that is driven with a whirlwind out of the floor and as the smoke out of the chimney. So there you are. That's it. If there's some substance to you tonight, if your word means anything, if your faith grabs your heart, if you have a love for the Lord Jesus Christ, you respect the Bible, you have fellowship one with another, you pray, you have a prayer life, you read the Bible, ask God to open your heart to it. That's an indication that you have substance in your life. Substance. Do you understand that the unsaved man, the only thing he cares about is getting drunk and being, and being entertained? He'll spend 99% of his time being amused. <laughs> he will. I told you before, you lock him up in a room five minutes and turn off all of his noise, all of his music, all of the rest of it, and let, let him spend five minutes in quiet. It'll drive him crazy. He has to be constantly, you know, he has to hear his music, be with his crowd, uh, drink his drink. That's his life. His life is a very shallow life. Very shallow, folks. Very shallow. Now, in your Christian life, if you're getting shallow, it's because you're not putting any effort into it. No effort whatsoever. You need to put some effort into it. I heard a man talking a few years ago, talking about uh, one of the old golfing uh, pros. Uh, I'm talking about 60, 70 years ago. I forget who he was. <coughs> but he would stand uh, all day long all day, hour, eight, ten hours a day, just driving a golf ball, one run after another, after another, after another. Well, you know what the Apostle Paul said? He said, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. In other words, I want to know about him. I want to talk about him. I want to love him more. I want to understand him. I want him to be part of my life. I'm nothing apart from him. The Lord Jesus Christ is everything or he's nothing. The Lord Jesus Christ is the greatest gift of heaven. He's the most precious one that we'll ever know or ever will understand anything about because the Lord Jesus Christ one day will take you to the Father. Without the Son, you'll never know the Father. No man knows the Father but the Son. No man knows the Son but the Father. And that's a wonderful thing tonight because he came to me. In the book of Galatians chapter number 4, if you'd like to turn there with me, verse 21. Galatians chapter number 4, verse 21. To get the context of what Paul's talking about, he says this, Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? It is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. 
which things, now look at this, are an allegory. For these are the two covenants, the one from Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. And for this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and still is over there, and is in bondage with her children. But now note what he says. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Now that's a remarkable statement. That's something to think about. You remember when God told Moses, he said, now I want you to build this tabernacle according to the mount, according to the pattern given to you in the mount. God said, I'm going to show you exactly how it is. I want you to I'm going to show you how it's going to be built, everything about it. And the pattern that was given to him in the mount was nothing in the more, more than a reflection of that one that's already up there. See, there's a temple up there in heaven. There's a mercy seat in heaven. There's an Ark of the Covenant in heaven. In heaven. Before it was ever on this earth, it was up there, it's up there in the third heaven. Not the first or second, but the third. So in plain words, what we're doing down here on this earth is a reflection of what's been happening in heaven. This is what he's talking about. And you know, of course, that God knows it all before he ever does any of it. He knows all things. Known unto God are all of his works. And I can serve a God like that, can't you? But it says that Jerusalem, which is above, is free, and it's the mother of us all. Now, the apostle uses this comparison to tell these people, these Judaizers, that wanted to be back under the law. Listen, you want to go back under something that is unbondage. You want to go back under something that's going to lock you up. You're going to go back under something that offers you no hope whatsoever. There is no hope in the law. No hope. No, no. The law was given as a schoolmaster to bring them to Christ. That's what he said in the book of Galatians. So here in Galatians chapter 4, he said, Jerusalem, which is above, is free. Now, in Revelation chapter number 21 and verse 2, John said, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. There's a New Jerusalem. Which one is it? I believe it's the same, in the, the same one. The Jerusalem which is above is free, and it's the mother of us all. So let's try to get a little of the identity of this Jerusalem. It's not the Father's bride, folks. No, no. God the Father's bride is Israel. Not the church, not the church. The church is called the bride of Christ. New Jerusalem is a city prepared for the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Amen. Revelation 21 verse 9 says, There came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues. Talked with me saying, Come hither and I'll show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. Now don't you think about this for a minute. You're going to get into eternity. And I told you, you're a member of the church of the firstborn. You remember I preached to you from the Song of Solomon just the other day where it says, my bride is but one, just one. I don't have two brides. I don't have three brides. I have one church, and that church is my bride, and that's it. When I'm finished with making up my bride, my bride is finished. The Bible said he shall present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. He prepares his bride for himself. And he will present her and come and get her and catch her up to meet him in the clouds. That means we're unique. Now look at this. There came one of the seven vials full of seven plagues. Come hither, I'll show you the bride, the lamb's wife. He carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God. The holy Jerusalem, forever indication to me, is the new Jerusalem. Notice three things about it. A new heaven, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem. Now think about this for a moment. The new Jerusalem is the bride. The new earth is for the Jew. The new heaven is for the Gentile. Jew, Gentile, and church of God retain their identity going into eternity. Jew, Gentile, church of God. That's basic and fundamental. In studying the Bible, find out, are we talking to the Jew? Are we talking to the Gentile? Are we talking to the church of God? You get in trouble when you start taking passages that relate only to Israel and turn around and apply them to the church, you get in trouble. Or with it, one that applies to the Gentiles and turn around and apply it to the church. It won't work. You get in all kinds of problems. Remember, the Bible is not made to make you a Baptist. The Bible is not written to make you a Baptist or Presbyterian or a Lutheran. The Bible, the Word of God, was written to reveal and make, not, and make God known to man in every age, regardless of when and where you live. So, there's no question about it. Every born-again believer 
to be born of the Spirit of God. A man spoke to me the other day right here in this church, and he said, what does it really mean to be born again? You see, not one of our members, but he said, what does it mean? Well, I'm not saying that to be critical tonight. I'm saying that to be observant. There are so many churches out there that do not preach the new birth. They don't preach it. And so, and so therefore, people don't have no, they have no clue what you're talking about. The most, the, the most basic, basic understanding of the new birth is this, to be born of God. How are you born of God? You are born of the Holy Spirit of God. What's that mean? That means that your dead spirit has been resurrected and given new life. The life of the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ is now yours. You're in him, he's in you. That's called the reciprocal indwelling of Christ. That's the beginning. That's the foundation. That's the basis to be born of God. You cannot be born of God by good works, church membership, mean well, tithes, money. No, it has to be the gift of God and it's received by grace through faith. And you believe, you receive it, and by doing that, you put God on the stand to honor his word. He that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he's a reward of them that diligently seek him. God will honor his word. I hear brethren on time on the radio all the time, and they say, God, honor your word. No, 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 no. <laughs> Don't tell God to honor his word. His word's alive. You don't have to tell him to honor his word. He will honor his word. It will not return void. Well, who can be born again, preacher? Anybody. You'd be surprised at the stuff God will take. He took me. Did he take you? Well, he'll take anything. Now, you get in a bunch of highbrow churches where they think there's something. They don't like that kind of talk. But I'm going <laughs> to tell you something right now. He, Christ, died, tasted death for every man, regardless of who we are. Amen. Amen. Every last one of us. So, here's what he says about this new Jerusalem, Hebrews 12. But ye are come unto Mount Sion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Now, this is all typology. When they came to Mount Sinai, if they so much as touched it, they'd die. There was no grace there. There was no grace. God was manifesting holiness. Holiness was manifested before grace was manifested. And they'd die, just like when Uzzah touched that ark as it was falling, ark of the covenant. God smote him dead in his tracks. He died. And when the Ark of the Covenant had come out of, uh, out of uh, Philistine land, and it was uh, uh, the, the men of uh, what Beth Shemesh, I think it was, they opened it up and they looked in and tens of thousands of them died right on the spot. Why'd they die? Why didn't the Philistines die? They died because they had knowledge. The Philistines were ignorant. God will judge you if you have knowledge for the knowledge you have. And he'll also judge you for not wanting any more knowledge and the knowledge you don't have. That's the sad thing about the church. We pay the preacher, let him take care of it. What about you, dear friend? Read your Bible and pray over it. Every Christian, every Christian that names the name of Christ should be able to come down here to this altar and open up a Bible and show someone how to be saved. Every single one of you, you ought to be able to do that if you truly know the Lord. I start with them where I went. Romans chapter number 10, verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Yeah, notice it just simply said call and you can be saved. So this new Jerusalem is the heavenly Jerusalem. In Revelation 21, 9, he said, I'll show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. That's the new Jerusalem coming down. But here's the thing that's remarkable for me. Revelation 21, verse 12. I want you to notice this with me tonight. In Revelation chapter number 21 and verse number 12. And it had a wall great and high and had 12 gates and at the gates 12 angels. 
and the names written thereon, which are the names of the what? Twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Here it is, the Lamb's bride, yet they have the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. That means that there is a connection. So what is it? The connection is the family of God. We're the church of the firstborn. They will be added later. More will be added. They will not be added as bride. He's only got one bride, but they will be added as the family of God. Revelation 21, 14, the wall of the city had 12 foundations. In them, the names of the 12 apostles of the lamb. So you've got the 12 apostles and you've got the 12 tribes of Israel. Revelation 21, 27, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Amen. Now there's a book of life in the Lamb's book of life. When do you get into the Lamb's book of life? The moment you're born of the Spirit of the living God, your name goes into that Lamb's book of life. Revelation 21, 18 says, And the building of the wall of it was of jasper. The city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundation of the wall of the city garnished with all manner of precious stones. And then it goes into all these stones. It goes into the emerald. There are those that say that the emerald, it's a green stone. It symbolizes Judah. Remember now, we've got 12 precious stones and we've got 12 tribes of Israel. How many of you remember the high priest in the Old Testament, how he appeared? He had holiness to the Lord, okay? And he had a breastplate with 12 stones. He had epilepsy on his, on, his, on his shoulder with 12 stones. In other words, these 12 stones were prominent, prominent. They were there constantly before their eyes. They're gemstones. They're beautiful. And the light playing off of that, there's no way in the world it's that for us today that we could really get a hold of how beautiful that that high priest must have been. In his appearance, because of none other dressed like him, you could pick the high priest out in a heartbeat with that breastplate. And yet here we have these 12 stones mentioned again. Here they are mentioned with streets of pure transparent gold, of walls of jasper and gates of pearl, gold and pearl and transparent, pure, pure gold, pure gold, as pure as it comes. And we have these 12 stones. And why are they there? They're there to remind you of where it all came from and what the beauty is about. The sapphire symbolizes a blue stone. They say it symbolizes Simeon. The sardonyx, a red and white stone, symbolizes Dan. The chalcedony, white translucent stone, symbolizes Levi. The topaz, a light Yellow orange stone symbolizes Issachar. Chrysolite, gold stone that symbolizes Gad. Beryl, stone like frozen fire, symbolizes Asher. Sardius, brownish red stone, symbolizes Naphtali. The jacinth, a dusty red stone, symbolizes Joseph. Amethyst, a light purple crystal that symbolizes Benjamin. Or Benjamin. Chrysoprasis, a golden green stone symbolizes Zebulun, and then the jasper, a transparent crystal that symbolizes Reuben. Notice Reuben's the last one on the list. How come? Why is he not first? Because he was the firstborn. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. These were the firstborns that Leah, Leah, that Leah had. How come Reuben is not there? How, come, how did Judah wind up taking the place of Reuben? Anybody know why? Sure you know why. He defiled his father's bed. He sure did. And that's what happened over there in the book of uh, Genesis when uh, Noah awakened from his, uh, his, little, uh, his little bout with, uh, with wine. Uh, he saw what his younger son had done to him. You see, he had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. All right. Japheth and Shem. Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. Japheth shall dwell in his tents. And when they saw their father naked, drunk, passed out, they took a sheet-like thing and they backed in, backed in there, laid it down upon him. That's what they did. They didn't want to look upon him. They, wanted to defi they did not want to defile their father's bed. That's what it was about. But Ham did. 
And this is where he said, cursed be Canaan. Now he couldn't curse Ham because Ham had been blessed, but he cursed his progeny. And so the land of Israel was occupied by Canaanites. And Israel had to drive out the Canaanite. He had to drive the Canaanite who was cursed out of the land that was blessed. And that's just what happens. And it's, uh, and it's, it's one of those biblical things. And once you begin to understand it, then you understand what's going on. The book of Revelation, therefore, if you'll turn over here with me. Revelation. And uh, we'll get on down here to, uh, I'll have to find it. All right, now look at this. Chapter number 21. And verse number 24. Revelation 21, 24. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. Now see this? They're walking outside in the light of it. And notice they're called nations. They're called nations because they're Gentiles. The nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. But it retains its identity. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So we're going into eternity. We can come and go. That's our home, but we can come and go as we please because our part, we're citizens. Our citizenship now is not here. Our citizenship is in heaven. I'm already a citizen of the new Jerusalem. Hallelujah. Amen. He said in John 14, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive into myself that where I am, there you may be also. And good old Thomas, true to his character, said, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? The Lord said, Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Nothing's changed about that. No, no. Buddhism will not take you to the Father. No, it won't. Mohammedism or Islam will not take you to the Father. Oh, no, 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 no. No. The religion of, of Japan... Shinto will not take you to the Father. Uh -uh. The religion of India, the Hindu, which is dominant, will not take you to the Father. The old, uh, the old religions of the worship, the creation, uh, pantheism and so forth, will not take you to the Father. The only way to the Father is through the Son. And the only thing that can call itself a church today is a body of believers that exalts the Lord Jesus Christ over anything and everything and everybody. He is preeminent. His name is infinitely above every name. That should be your identity and my identity is the Lord Jesus Christ. You should be about him. You should be living for him. You should be filled with his spirit. I heard a woman say one time on radio, she said, the Holy Ghost translation is a terrible translation. It should be Holy Spirit. The Greek word for spirit is pneuma. Pneuma. Pneumatos. We get a pneumatic drill. It's air. Now, of course, I've told you a thousand times, spirit cannot be defined because we don't know the essence of a spirit. We don't know there's things about spirit that we do not know, and we simply leave it alone. But you see, here's what she said. She said, now, you know, this business of ghost is, is an old archaic English thing going back to the time. I remember when I grew up, my grandmother and grandfather used to talk about haints. How many ever heard about a haint? Everybody know what a haint is? <laughs> I knew what a haint was when I, when I was six years old. I didn't, want, I didn't want to mess around with any haints. Well, that's a ghost. That's a ghost. Now, so what's wrong with Holy Ghost? Do you know what a ghost is? It's the appearance of someone that's going on. Isn't it? Isn't that what it's supposed to be? It's the appearance of someone who's passed on. So would the Holy Ghost be the appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ in spirit form? How does not the Bible say, if any man have not the spirit of who? He's none of his. 
Christ. Yeah. Exactly. So I would be, I would be careful about pounding, pouncing on that and saying that the Holy Ghost is a bad translation. No, not necessarily. Truth of the matter is, things like that, if you'll just get your Bible and do a little research in it, you might be surprised at why they use Holy Spirit in one place and Holy Ghost in another. Those King James translators were nobody's fool, folks. They were the highest educated people in their time. Fifty men got together and translated this Bible. And then they compared their translation. Plain words, they didn't get together in one spot and consult with each other as they did it. They group here, group here, group here, group here. And they did the translation. Then they came together. And then they compared what they had done. And uh, that's what you got today. The authorized version, 1611. The King James Bible. Can you get saved from the other Bibles? Oh, yeah, you can. I heard another preacher say, you're only begotten by the goodness or by the perfection of the word that you hear preached. That if, you're here, if you hear a message preached from any other translation than the King James Bible, you cannot be saved. And he pastored one of the largest churches in this country. Folks, that's terrible. That's terrible. Bill Pierce, who went to California and served in the prison system out there for 40 years, was sitting in the loft of a house somewhere reading the living Bible. The living Bible. And he got saved. And his salvation stuck for 50 years. It's not that I recommend it, but the Word of God can't be bound. You can get saved from these other books, but here's the one that I go to when I want to settle some issue. It's this one. It's this one right here. From the received text. Thousands, 5,000 5, pieces attest to the veracity of that book. That's right. The vast majority. That's why it's called the majority text that the King James Bible is translated from. Father, thank you tonight, Lord. We've been able to come into your house. I pray I've said a few things tonight. Be a blessing to people. Encourage them. My Father, I pray in Jesus' name. Give us light. You know the heart. And you know the motive. You know if somebody really wants light. You, you know if they're, if, they're, if, they're, if they're confused about things, but they, they, they decide to just stay in their confusion. They really don't want to know. You know that too. But Father, if they're really hungry and there are things bothering them and they want an answer, my Father, you tell us plainly in your word, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God that upbraideth not. And Father, I pray for wisdom tonight. First off, I want wisdom. I want understanding. I, I'm a student of the Bible, Lord. I'm no master of this book, but I believe it. And Father, I pray for every soul in this house that they'd feel the same way, that there are many things they know and many they don't know, but they know the author, and they'll ask you to help them with the things that they don't understand. And our Heavenly Father, I'll pray this now in Jesus' name, for his sake. Amen. Amen.